Chesterton and Dorothy Sayers were right when they basically said the problem with Christianity is that most Christians don't have a clear idea of what we believe in. <laughs> and if we took seriously our belief in grace, what I've discovered is I give parish missions all over the United States. Mm -hmm. And there are very devout people that come. But for most of them, the idea of grace is something that they haven't really thought about for a long time. Yeah. And yet it's the central point of our religion. Mm -hmm. And so it's very sad. That's why I wrote the book. Here we go. Hello and welcome to the Focusing Way podcast. I'm your host, Davide Battistella. Find The Focusing Way on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and our website, thefocusingway.com. Father Brian Milady, OP, received his doctorate in sacred theology from the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Angelicum, where he taught for several years. Currently a professor at Holy Apostle Seminary in Connecticut, Father Milady has had several popular series on EWTN. He is the author of the book, Grace Explained, How to Receive and Retain God's Most Potent Gift. And joining me now on the Focusing Way podcast, Father Brian Milady. Welcome. Thank you very much. Nice to talk to you, Dave. Thank you. You know, we often hear the words, be grateful, and your book, uh, Grace Explained, How to Receive and Retain God's Most Potent Gift, was a real uh, eye-opening thing for me, because we often hear the words, be grateful, or the phrase, be grateful for what you have. Um, but you take these simple concepts of gratitude and of grace, and you explain them and elevate grace to a whole deeper meaning in our lives. So while you explain the different types of grace which exist, you also talk about how to receive the grace of God. And this elevates grace to our whole being and a spiritual level of giving and receiving. So I'd like to begin by asking you, where do you begin when you want someone to truly understand grace? I usually begin with the soul and the examination of what perfects the soul, because this is the whole issue between philosophy and theology. Uh, is reason sufficient to perfect the powers of our soul? Well, Aristotle would say no, and Thomas Aquinas would say no, and I would say no, but the Enlightenment, of course, which we live with daily still, would say yes. There's no further knowledge necessary than what human reason can resolve. Now, some of them arrived at this position through very Christian reasons, because God was perfect. They thought that he couldn't create a being that was less perfect than he was. This is the kind of best of all possible worlds scenario. But in fact, yes, it's true God is perfect, and he creates us perfectly for what we are. But the issue is, what fills the powers of our soul, our potentials. The highest potential in man is his intellect. Once a person knows one relationship of cause and effect, which they basically learn, we, we, we learn when we're children, we have this kind of dynamism. It's almost like a, an arrow that you point in a certain direction to want to know the whole picture. But we come up against the wall because the whole picture means experiencing infinity, which our minds by nature can't do. Mm -hmm. So we need help from God. And this is regardless of sin. We need help because our minds cannot be perfectly in action until the final explanation is seen, the cause in its completion. And that can only occur after this life. And it can only occur when God plunges us into himself. And the means by which we get there is what we traditionally refer to as grace. Mm -hmm. So the dynamism of man's mind is, is the essential to understanding why we need grace in order to be fulfilled or fully alive as human beings. Remember, I made a 
uh, point. We're talking about that banner they used to make in the 60s. Yeah, that was my next question, actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah. St. Irenaeus. Yeah. The glory of God is man fully alive. Well, that tended to become very humanistic in its interpretation. But they forgot the second part of the quote, which is the glory of God is man fully alive. But man fully alive is only man when he sees God. And see there means intellectual sight. It means without medium. Whether that medium is creation or even Christ's human nature, mm -hmm. it means without medium. Mm -hmm. So in heaven, we experience a lie of glory, which is infinity itself, that we receive it in a limited way because we're limited beings. But what we're actually receiving is God's truth and God's love as he experiences it in the Holy Trinity. Yeah. Yeah, that quote about man being fully alive is often cut in half, the, the back half of that quote. Uh, you know, and it's a way that we sort of cherry pick words out of the out of scripture to suit our present purposes. And then when they're taken out of context like that, it can be it can be problematic. Exactly. Exactly. The same is true with Thomas Aquinas. I read more strange things than Thomas said because they only quoted one part of the sentence. Mm -hmm. you know, he makes distinctions all the time, but the distinction doesn't come through. <laughs> so, yeah. Your book yeah. talks a lot about proactive things one can do to increase grace in our lives. And can you share with us some of the actions people can take um, to the very many graces God places on us? Well, first of all, of course, you have the sacraments, which are the primary actions by which we receive grace. But then once the sacraments begin to transform you, uh, living the life of charity on an everyday level with ordinary things with great love is the important thing about our lives. You know, I even to this day, I still know people who want to practice great austerities of body and things like that. You know, fasting, and vigils, and all this, there's a scourging, whatever. And all the spiritual authors of the book are clear. I mean, those things have some limited value in your life. But the most important thing is to love as God loves and to know as God knows. Mm -hmm. And that means, uh, of course, you have to have some kind of life of prayer. Now, you don't have to have one like a person in a religious order does where you have a lot of time to do this but you have to have some sort of life where normally in the dominicans we recommend the rosary to help with this mm -hmm. there are all kinds of different things you could experience in order to help you with your life of prayer and that basically means to allow god to open you because he's always first in his initiative to open you to receiving his infinity which we received in baptism by grace. We're, we're elevated to know as God knows and love as God loves. And, you know, the big quote for that is 2 Peter 1.4. Even the Council of Trent used it against the Protestant Reformation, that he has given us great and precious gifts, that we who fled from a world of sin might become, and then he says, partakers of divine nature. Now, that means... That we're not, we're, of course, we're still human beings. We're not infinite. But we receive a plus added to the very center of our souls, what philosophers would call the essence of your soul, by which our soul is elevated so we can experience a conversation with the Trinity. Um, how does grace increase our divine nature and allow us to open up that inner relationship to God that you mentioned? Okay, well, first of all, we don't have a divine nature. We are participants in it. Okay. We don't have a human nature. But what it does is, first of all, sanctifying grace is God's infinite nature. Mm -hmm. So when we experience it in a finite way, we receive the ability, like I said, to enter into conversation with the Trinity. And as we go along, and this is what's recounted in mystical authors like St. Teresa of Avila or John of the Cross, slowly but surely, this divine nature begins to transform our outlook, mm. our, the reason we love. 
So that a person who's experiencing the advanced stage of this is actually experiencing a wedding bond almost with the Lord. And they nothing's left for them but the beatific vision. Uh, they can experience God on earth, but only through faith and love. And of course, the problem is this doesn't satisfy us mm. because since you want to know, faith makes you realize that you don't know everything. Mm -hmm. and that your mind is continuously being expanded. And if you love God, then that makes you not satisfied with what you receive, but it makes you long for more always and to you, to you die. And uh, so that's why St. Teresa used to say, uh, muero porque no muero, I'm dying because I don't die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're ha we have to be happy to be here. We know God wants us here. You know, because this is the way we get to heaven. It's our pilgrimage. And we want other people to come along, too. But the final experience is vision. Yeah, that moment you describe so many times in the book of coming face to face. Uh, or Just the, heaven. It only happens in heaven. Yeah, that can only happen after death. Yeah. Right. And so grace is intrinsically tied to original sin. And Adam's fall from no, grace. No, not, no, 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 no. Remember, Adam and Eve needed grace before the sin in order to go to heaven. Okay. It becomes tied to original sin once it is committed. Yeah. And it's, it's tied to original sin uh, is that it points to a greater grace than the one Adam and Eve received when they were first created, namely the grace of the incarnation, which is a miracle. Right. We need a redeemer. And so Christ, that grace, Christ isn't just a partaker of divine nature. He's the divine person of the word who adds a human nature to himself as a means of acting. But um, see, the problem many people have is when they talk about grace, all they're thinking about is getting freed from sin. Well, yeah, we should be free from sin. We should be free from original sin. Original sin is a sin of nature, but why on earth do we need to be free? We need to be free because it keeps us from realizing our perfection. And our perfection has to be uh, underlined in that in order that we can have a proper attitude toward it. So, for example, we, I talk in the book about justification. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Lutheran picture of justification is that God just overlooks your sins, but you remain totally depraved. Yeah. Um, our idea is. Okay, what we would find justification, the catechism uses the Council of Trent's quote to do this. It's both, both and Catholic options, always both and, both the forgiveness of sins and the sanctification and renewal of the interior person. Mm -hmm. Because we were created, what is St. Augustine, we were created for yourself and our hearts are restless until they rest of thee. And that presents an original sin or any sins. The problem sin causes, we can't do that then. Yeah. So that needs to be cured. It's it's so wonderful to have these saints to turn to who were approaching this and could uh, understand it in a profound way after probably many years of contemplation or their own conversions or their own prayer experiences. Um, well, you remember that in the early part of the 20th century, there was a long dispute about whether the laity were called to contemplation. Mm -hmm. And the church has always been clear that they are. Mm -hmm. So there were authors like Father Arantero, Father Almond. Um, even, even though I disagree with Father de Lubach about his explanation, his purpose was a very good one. I mean, they wanted to demonstrate to the laity that they were called not the contemplative life in a monastery, but they were called the contemplation because it's the natural fruit of baptism. Mm -hmm. And so uh, in a sense, we're all being sanctified and the saints help us to understand our own struggles with this because they've been through it. But uh, unfortunately, I, I think that um, Chesterton and Dorothy Sayers were right when they said, of course, uh, Dorothy Sayers was an Anglican. When they basically said the problem with Christianity is that most Christians don't have a clear idea of what we believe in. <laughs> and if we took seriously our belief in grace, 
what I've discovered is I give parish missions all over the United States. Mm -hmm. And there are very devout people that come. But for most of them, the idea of grace is something that they haven't really thought about for a long time. Yeah. And yet it's the central point of our religion. Mm -hmm. And so it's very sad. That's why I wrote the book. Yeah. Yeah. And you write, I'm just going to quote you here, in in order for any human being to be really fully integrated, to be really perfect, reason and science are not enough. Faith is necessary. So reason and science are needed, but can you describe why faith is a necessary part of the human condition? Because we are brought to a wall regarding the causality of the world by reason alone. Mm. It's like the fox before the grapes. The philosophers, like I believe Aristotle, went very far in this, but he was brought to a wall. In his ethics, for example, after painting a beautiful picture of human nature, he, he ends it by saying, the reason you form yourself in virtue is to experience divine contemplation. But then he says, but I don't know anybody who's like this. And that's why the companion work is the politics. Mm. We have to be content with doing what good we can do here on earth. And they all know that that's not the fullest experience. So it's like the fox before the grapes. They kind of see the grapes are delicious, but there's no way to arrive at it. And so pagan man goes away sad. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that frees us from that sadness is faith in Christ. See, unfortunately, in the 19th century, Faith became reduced to emotion. Yeah. And you'll hear that today where people will say, well, don't teach people doctrine. You know, it's not about propositions. It's about persons. Well, well, that's true. But the problem is the propositions are about the persons. Yeah. So let's say I said, I love you and this is what you're like. And you said, I'm sorry, you must be loving somebody else because that's not what I'm like at all. Well, that's why we have to study the propositions. Because the propositions help us to understand the persons. And we can't experience personal union by our own power with God. He has to elevate us to that. So that's why faith begins, justification begins with faith. But it doesn't end with faith. The natural completion of faith is charity. Mm -hmm. Because faith is a very peculiar virtue. It involves both the intellect and the will. So both truth and love go together. And they can't be played off against each other. But people today, well, as long as you're loving, it doesn't matter what you think. Mm. I was a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, there's um, there's a moment. Uh, I'm just going to find that question I have exa- exactly about that. But I, let's go to baptism for a second. Because okay. you, 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 we've mentioned it a few times. And the book offers a wonderful explanation of um, how baptized babies still have free will because they still have to complete their walk toward faith later in life and to receive further sacraments. Yeah. Right. Which is when they reach the age of reason. First. Right. So, but can we talk a bit about free will and how can free will go hand in hand with God's will? And what is the best way to discern between what our free will is inviting for us and what God wants and has prepared for us? Uh, well, our free will is drawn to good, but in indiscriminate good. Mm-hmm. What gives our free will its focus is the intellect. So that's why conscience is not a feeling, although people would, they would like to make it a feeling, but it's a syllogism logical syllogism of reasoning that ends in a judgment. Now, if you conform yourself to the judgment and the judgment's true, then you experience what we call the virtue of prudence. If you don't conform yourself to the judgment, you act against your conscience, you commit a sin. Or if your judgment is faulty and you act according to your conscience, you still objectively commit a sin, even though you don't look on it that way. So you have to allow your uh, free will to be formed by truth. And of course, the truth is the mind as a dynamism is drawn to know the cause of the world itself. In other words, 
Remember Aristotle talks about wonder, Mm. wonder at the universe that begins all philosophy, but it can't end until the first and primary cause, which not be the first in a series, but the foundational cause of the world is directly experienced. And we know that to be God, Mm -hmm. not not his existence alone, but the more you know he exists, you want to know what he is. Mm -hmm. Well, that forms the will's journey. So every other power in man can be satisfied with some other good as far as the will is concerned, but not the intellect. And that's why St. Thomas, in one of the works I quote, says, let them them be ashamed then. Mm -hmm. Place the perfection of man so low when it is so highly situated. Yeah, yeah. You also write, grace is human integrity. Right. Sin is human destruction. Right. Can, can you further explain this and how Christ is again, the new keystone? Well, again, it, 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 it occurs over the whole idea of perfection. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you think you can become perfected by your reason alone, then you don't need grace and sin isn't really an issue. One of the reasons the Freemasons are a religion is because they basically think that human reason can resolve all issues. Mm. Well, we've seen how well that worked recently. Happened, mm, it, yes. it doesn't work at all. And yet people aren't drawn to grace and God then. They're drawn uh, to try some other solution. But they, they control themselves because human beings hate surrendering control. Yeah. Well, you, you have to surrender control to God. Now, um, you asked about Christ. Christ is the keystone because... After the sin was committed, the only way for us to experience, in other words, our nature isn't just a a nature that's um, neutral, it's wounded. Mm -hmm. So in order for our nature to be made whole, we have to be redeemed. Now, that brings a further grace, which also glorifies God, and glorifies God more than Adam and Eve being created in grace. And that's why it's called the greater mercy. Mm-hmm. And that's why we say that the final purpose of God's creation is his glorification in Christ. Mm. Because he knew the sin would be committed. He allowed the sin to be committed, but he didn't leave human beings just being sinful. Mm-hmm. Uh, he brought forth a greater mercy. Yeah. Well, when, you, when you think about the incarnation, uh, I know <clears throat> we're used to thinking about God taking flesh, but it's a stupendous mystery. It's a miracle. Yeah. And there is no final explanation that we can understand about it. It's a choice by God. And the more we meditate out, the more there is to appreciate and know. So the Lord is at the center of this mystery. And of course, he's the one that judges the living and the dead too because of that. Mm-hmm. And not just as God, but in his human mouth. Yeah. 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 Yeah, And it it also goes sort of back to Adam because he falls out of grace because he no longer believes he needs God to continue with his life. He figures, you know, to put it in a modern terminology, you know, I got this, I can do this on my own. And then uh, this idea that I can go it alone what ends up happening is he ends up actually hiding from God. God has to come and seek them out. Um, so, yeah, no, I guess I'm sort of wondering, how do we invite grace so that we are no longer hiding? That we're Because we all have that component to our, our sin. Well, of course, from baptism, we most of us were baptized as babies. Mm-hmm. So we didn't have to make that choice, if you want to put it that way. But for a person who's an adult at conversion, that's why in conversion, you first of all have to be sorry for your sins. Yeah. And then that leads you to be open to receiving the mercy of God. And when all you do is make a crack, an infinitesimal thing, why this, why? And he's there. Mm-hmm. And then you're doomed. <laughs> I remember <laughs> I, had, I had a friend who fell away from the church. Mm-hmm. And we were chatting and he said, well, 
I don't go to church anymore, but I do say the rosary. I said, oh, you're doomed. You better come back because Mary's not going to leave you if you say the rosary. Yeah. You're going to have to come back. Mm-hmm. And he did, actually. Yeah. But um, no, it's, uh, remember, conversion, I talk about justification. Mm-hmm. And justification, what you do is turning from one way of life to another. Now, the way we look on it is our initiatives first. But actually, it's God's initiative that's first. Mm-hmm. So depending on which way you look at it, God's initiative comes first or our turning comes first. But the essential part is, his grace is always there waiting. But we have to be open to receiving it. As, as the greatest conversion in the history of the church demonstrates, which is St. Paul's. Yeah. 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 And, and it calls to mind the prayer Jesus gave gives us right where the, the the that very important line thy will be done and you right. were talking about uh, i know in my own life that that is has been a um a point of letting go of of really saying is it my will or is it thy will and uh it's it's such powerful words that he gave us uh, to in that one sentence of of the our father um right yeah, uh, but I, one of the reasons one of the reasons why religious take a vow of obedience because uh, you may have all your will you want, but when you promise to defend the defend on somebody else's judgment and their direction, you're being honest hmm. that you don't control the world. Now they may not do a very good job either. Yeah. <laughs> Superiors are not infallible, right? Yeah, but the very fact that you surrender control of your life. To someone else uh, is your desire to allow God to to, to guide you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and everything in the culture is kind of uh, not pointing us in that direction. In that's in right, exactly. Yeah. But I think that's true of a lot of cultures. Yes, the history of the world. We think ours is unique in this, but um, it's true that the pagans the, generally. I mean except for the Muslims, they had an openness to whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, the Romans were very cynical about religion. I mean, as long as you, yeah. as long as you threw your incense in the thing to the emperor, they didn't really care what you thought about it, basically, mm-hmm. because they, they were very skeptical about uh, religious truth. But um, once we realize that we can only be perfected by uh, seeing God, that demands a certain surrender on your part to him and you know we can kick and scream all we want about it but after all we really do control very little of our destiny yeah yeah, uh, yeah. We, what we control is our reaction to it a bit more or less or but, maybe uh, also also coming to the understanding that our work here is the work of the soul that we're 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 carrying this soul in in us and i just want to read this uh This takes us to the Holy Spirit, and you write, the action of the Holy Spirit isn't just something exterior to us. It comes from within the very character of our being itself. It is closer to me than I am to myself. It's the capstone of our nature. Well, and that comes from a quote of St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. He said, God is closer to us than we are to our very selves. Just by creation, first of all, because how could we exist from nothing unless God was intimately supporting us in existence? But then to think that not only do we exist, but he also gives us an intellect and will to know him, the spiritual soul. And then finally, that he invites us to see him as an object of communion and blessedness the love of the Holy Spirit. I mean, this should convince people how much God loves them. Mm-hmm. Yet people just forget about it all. It's religion is a, a poor part they compartmentalize in their life. Not everybody, but a lot of people are mm-hmm. like that. And uh, fortunately, there's been a lot of in- interesting reversions to the faith. Interesting, especially on the part of Hispanic males. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know in the Southwest and California, boy, they come back and they're tough people when they come back, you know? Yeah. 
but they sown a few wild oats first and then they realized that this is just their life is meaningless in some ways without God. And so they come. I know we're coming close to our time. I have two more questions. So I'm keeping an eye on it for us as well. Um, But I just wanted to ask from your experience, do you think perhaps that people can or are experiencing grace without a full understanding of what gifts are being bestowed upon them? And what are they missing and not realizing these graces they're receiving? Yeah. Oh, I think uh, grace is a work in a lot of people's lives and they don't realize it. Um, the only thing that would be missing is you have a lot of people who, uh, you talk to them about virtue and they think of Mother Teresa picking up, she said, they're dying on the streets of Calcutta. They don't realize that getting up to take care of their sick child can be a work of supernatural virtue too. Mm-hmm. Remember, any action done from love is sufficient to merit heaven, whether it's sweeping the floor or uh, you know cleaning the toilets out or something like that. Mm-hmm. I always tell people in religious life, there's nothing you learn particularly attractive as a novice, in, you know, cleaning out the toilet or washing the dishes. But of course, if nobody did that, we'd all die. Yeah. I mean, it can be a important uh, place if you do not. As St. Teresa used to say, God is also among the pots and bands. Yeah, that's beautiful. You know, if you can find, and of course, they're not the highest actions, obviously, but they're actions where we show, again, we're honest about grace, that we we transform by grace. Toward the end of the book, it, it's really filled with some strong messages, which I really very much appreciate. And I'm just going to read, um, you write, when we lower our standards and our desires like this, it becomes easy to define religion down, say to a political program or just to feeling good about yourself. We think we can do anything we want as long as we're nice. I don't mean to alarm you, but you can be nice and still lose your soul. Right. So (laughs) tell me how important is it to be actively engaged in the work of our souls? Well, it should be the central issue. That's why I'm always amused. You know, I do this question thing on WTN now. Some guys say, why do we really have to go to mass anyway? Why is it a mortal sin? Duh, it's the Last Supper and the crucifixion and the (laughs) resurrection, the center of your salvation. If you say you love God, it's what you should occupy. All you have to do is an hour a week, and you're upset about that? What kind of love is that anyway? Mm -hmm. Duh, you know. But uh, no, they they talk about religion as though it's this, it's it's something that, uh, I saw a cartoon once in Doonesbury where this couple was searching for churches, the little church of the Walden. So they said, what's your message? And they say, so the minister says, well, you know, it's the basic Christian thing like redemption and sin and all that. Oh, we're not really sure that works for us. Redemption, that's awfully negative, you know. And then the one, <laughs> then the, one the husband says, well, let's try the Quakers. They had shuffleboard at least. You know? Oh, my goodness. Shopping around for churches, you know. I yeah. Mean, uh, yeah, that consumerism has penetrated even the the spiritual part of our culture, right? That it's a, that the, like there's all these uh, choices out there. Right. Um, I just uh, I'm very aware of our time, and I'm just wondering: is there anything that I haven't included that you would like to share, uh, just for our listeners or our viewers? Uh, in the book, there's some definitions of different kinds of grace. Yeah. And I think they're important to examine. So remember, sanctifying grace is, it's what's called the habit or quality. It's introduced into the essence of our soul, which allows us to enter into a supernatural relationship with God. Actual grace is an interior, not an interior change. Instead, it's God enlightening our minds and strengthening our wills to experience it by conversion or to live it. And then charismatic grace, people uh, have no problem with the charismatic movement, provided they realize that you can exercise the charismatic gifts of the Holy Spirit and still be in a state of mortal sin. Mm -hmm. Because 
uh, God gives those gifts for the sanctification of others. Mm-hmm. He isn't stymied by the weakness of his instruments and in giving those, but we need to change ourselves. Like Bishop Sheehan used to say, they'd say to him, you're so holy because you preach well, because he had the gift of preaching. Mm-hmm. They'd say, no, no, if I'm not holy when I get up there and after I preach and sit down, he says, I profit nothing by it, even mm-hmm. though millions may like my thoughts. Mm-hmm. So we, we need to be aware of that. That's all. Father Milady, thank, thank you, you so much for our time together today. Uh, it's a wonderful book. I really enjoyed it. I'm reading it again. The book is called Grace Explained, How to Receive and Retain God's Most Potent Gift. Great. Beautiful cover. Thank you so much for your time today. And enjoy Florence. <laughs> I wish I were there. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you were too. Okay, God bless. Okay. God bless. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay, God reward you. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play Music, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And visit our website at thefocusingway.com.